Welcome to this talk on process physics, which is a way of doing foundational physics that is biocentric, relational, and habit establishing in an open ended way. All this in stark contrast with our current mainstream physics, which sees nature as by itself lifeless and governed by deterministic physical laws. One particularly problematic feature of mainstream physics is that it rejects subjectivity by branding it as fully reducible to mere physical activity or even as illusory. In process physics, however, subjectivity is an early ecological feature. This is where the connection between process physics and ecological psychology can be made. In order to provide some context, we'll first take a look at Galileo and Newton, who threw overboard all qualitative subjective aspects of nature to be able to specify all quantifiable aspects of it. And although their physics turned out to be extremely successful, it is also inherently problematic, especially when it has to deal with complex biological systems. This is the main criticism of Robert Ulanovich, and also that of Stuart Kaufman, who argued that the emergence of autocatalytic networks is fundamentally at odds with the lifeless view of the Newtonian paradigm. This autocatalysis of early biochemical networks is thought to have occurred in a prebiotic primordial soup. From the reaction cycles in these autocatalytic networks, it's only a small step to get to perception action cycles in higher order organisms. Uh, we'll see how these cycles run not only through the organism, but also through the organism's environment, which forms a truly indivisible, hence ecological whole with the organism itself. An organism world system in line with J.J. Gibson's ecological psychology. Now, process physics is a way of doing foundational physics that is very much ecological in this same sense. It includes object-like as well as subject-like aspects in its modeling of nature. These aspects both appear as very, very early features within process physics relational model of nature. As this model runs its course, it gives rise to cellular uh, process structures with eventually emergent matter-like behavior. Furthermore, these structures turn out to develop a dispositional preference to hook up in a certain way that can be interpreted as a very primitive form of subjectivity. In order to be able to do mainstream physics, however, we must first put together a universe of discourse in which the system to be observed, here a solid bronze ball, is separated from its environment and the conscious observer at the other side. Here this observer is Galileo during one of his inclined plane experiments. Galileo made the separation between object and observer especially clear by making a strict distinction between all subjective aspects of conscious observation and the so-called objective aspects of what he thought was the entirely physical real world out there. However, it is not at all clear where this boundary between object and subject side should be drawn at all. Is it to be drawn between object and measuring instrument? Between instrument and observer? Between the eyes and the brain? or even between the mind and the physical world. Um, ultimately, it can be drawn anywhere. But by introducing his object-subject cut, Galileo pushed physics in the direction of mere quantification and a total neglect of qualitative aspects like the redness of red, the silky feel of silk, the saltiness of salt, etc. Only by stripping away all qualitative, subjective aspects of nature, it became possible to formulate the law of fall, and what later became known as Galileo's equation, S equals half a t squared, location expressed in terms of an object's acceleration and the time that it's been accelerating. With the arrival of Newtonian mechanics for earthly as well as celestial objects, the following Newtonian rules eventually became standard issue. Causal closure. There can be no non-physical influences affecting causal processes in the physical world. 
so no mental causation. Determinism. Everything that happens is governed strictly by mathematically spelled out laws of nature. Mechanism. Nature basically works like a clockwork machinery or a game of billiards, mostly through collisions and physical contact. Physicalism. The world is purely physical and conscious experience can be explained entirely in terms of physical brain activity, which finally amounts to reductionism. Although nowadays no one in science submits to all of these features in an absolute sense, the general drift of these Newtonian rules is still alive and well, and the program of reaching the full mathematization of nature is still the main aspiration for the physical sciences. However, as suggested by Gregory Bateson, Walter Alsasser and Robert Ulanovich, nature need not be fully regular to the bone, but stochastic self-referential events can lead to regularity in nature. These events, in which chance, self-referential feedback loops and history dependence all play a large role, are especially important in living systems. This can be seen in autocatalysis, for instance. Autocatalysis is the process through which a complex reaction network can arise as a primitive form of life from a primordial soup. A primordial prebiotic soup, like the warm little pond that was proposed by Charles Darwin, with a great many molecule species inside of it. According to theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman, with increasing diversity of molecule species, the chances will also increase that for any reaction already occurring within the primordial soup, there will be another molecule in the soup that can be a catalyst for it. In that case, it is only a question of time until there is enough diversity to enable the popping into actuality of an autocatalytic cycle of biochemical reactions. So we can see ordered autocatalytic cycles emerging from a largely indistinct background basin of initially low-profile chemical reactions. And from the perspective of the Newtonian paradigm, this popping into actuality of such an autocatalytic network, as well as its, as its further evolution, is totally unpredictable and cannot be properly accounted for. When one of its chemical cycles manages to draw in a photosensitive protein, such an early autocatalytic network can start to tap into light energy so that it can develop different adaptive reaction cycles in response to the presence or absence of light. In that case, light can become meaningful to the network's internal biochemistry, and the chemical network cycle in question can eventually evolve into something like a perception action cycle. When looking at full-fledged perception action cycles in human beings, the sensory motor pathways are continuously sculpted by value-related neuromodulators. Like this, musculoskeletal coordination is being refined and the organism's needs and desires can be fulfilled. In fact, it is the going through, the adaptively living through these life-supporting cycles that is the essence of the organism's conscious making sense of its world. A considerable part of these perception action cycles, or more precisely, sensation, valuation, motor activation, world manipulation cycles, runs through the organism's living environment. On top of that, no sharp and definitive boundary can be drawn between organism and its target world of interest. So therefore, we should ultimately accept that this process of sense making does not happen exclusively in the brain but actually involves the united effort of the organism world system as a whole as it goes through value mediated and meaning and habit establishing cycles of experience. Much like before with autocatalysis, higher order conscious experience arguably comes to the fore from an initially undifferentiated background called a Great Blooming Buzzing Confusion by William James. A buzzing confusion in which what we usually like to think of as external physical objects 
are gradually singled out in experience by going through perception action cycles. Also, sense of self and world comes into actuality by the coupling of extraceptive world related patterns and introceptive organism related patterns of activity. This going through these organism world cycles is in fact a non-stop cyclic process of sense making that does not take place exclusively in the brain. Since it cannot do without the part of the perception action cycle that runs through the environment, the constantly onflowing stream of experience that gives rise to a conscious sense of self and world is to be seen as utterly ecological. The way in which perception action cycles run through the organism world system is constantly being sculpted by what James, James J. Gibson calls affordances, action guiding differences in the energetic intensity of light, sound, tactile resistance, etc. All this in a constantly onflowing surrounding stream of informative energy differences called the ambient array. This is a short illustration of how the action inviting optic flow of the ambient array can be imagined. In this case, as seen from a first person perspective. So in stark contrast with the basic setup of mainstream physics, we are essentially not external from our target of observation. We don't perceive things from the outside, as Galileo believed, but we are inside the same process of nature that is our target of observation. We are not only inside the same process that we're trying to make sense of, but we are seamlessly embedded, biosphere inhabiting, and actively participating observers. We make sense of the world we're in by living through all kinds of organism world cycles, like the perception action cycle, a respiratory cycle, nutrient waste cycles, and all kinds of other cycles. All these cycles participate in a giant co-evolving network of non-equilibrium thermodynamic work cycles, whose source of energy comes from our sun, who in her turn is engaged in an even larger scale cycle. Still on Earth, however, the sun drives all kinds of evaporation processes, thus leading to worldwide cycling of water. Biological life and industrial activity take part in widespread O2 CO2 cycles that affect the composition of our atmosphere. And other major cycles that have their impact on the Earth ecology are the phosphorus and also the nitrogen cycle. All chemical elements that are involved in these cycles have once been produced and are still being produced in supernova explosions and expanding stars. In a process that is sometimes called cosmic recycling because of the reuse of nature's chemical elements in widely different settings. In contrast to mainstream physics, process physics suggests that nature has come into actuality in a way that can be compared with the emergence of early life through autocatalysis and the emergence of our conscious sense of self and world, both from a largely undifferentiated background of low-grade processuality. Here, this low-grade background can be interpreted as a primordial vacuum-like state, like this picture here. Closer up, this vacuum-like state may be seen as a fiercely fluctuating ocean of potential, which contains all of existence in latent form. Such radical potentiality is something which mainstream physics finds difficult to describe in, term of, in terms of its physical equations, because these equations only pertain to those singled out aspects of nature that can be measured or have been measured before. As a rule, physical equations do not and cannot present nature as a whole as one giant dispositional process. To avoid this limitation, therefore, process physics does not start out with lawful physical equations, 
but instead with what may be called routine of nature. So this routine of nature is here written as an iterative update routine that indexes connection strengths in a relational matrix. It runs through its update cycles again and again and each time it more or less adds a layer of noise over all individual nodes of the relation matrix. It can be pictured like this. The low-grade noisy activity looks like this when zooming in. The preceding connection strengths of all member nodes in the relation matrix are represented by BIJ old, which is the precedence term, looking like this from close up. The following two terms, the binding or cross-linkage term and the novelty infusing noise term, mostly cancel each other out. But in the long run, quite comparable to autocatalysis, there will be enough reactive load grade activity patterns to enable the emergence of a complexly outward branching network of higher order process structure. The beginning of which can be seen on your left hand side as it comes here. This emergent orderly behavior first appears in the form of connectivity nodes that relative to each other become spontaneously distributed in a three-dimensional way, forming cell-shaped 3D embeddable bubbles more or less. These bubbles, or cell-like spheres of connectivity, will hook up into a mushrooming network of branching structures which appear to have a sense of proto-subjectivity in the form of a dispositional preference of how to connect among each other. Next to proto-subjectivity, this network exhibits emergent relativistic and gravitational effects, emergent near-classical behavior, creative novelty, inherent time-like processuality with open-ended evolution, and many other features that we also find in nature itself. Especially impressive, however, is the neural network-like organization of the universe at a supergalactic scale as apparent in the Millennium Simulation, a large-scale supercomputer simulation of the universe. Much more can be said about this, but the most appealing aspect of process physics is probably its full compatibility with our best theories on life and consciousness. Early life, early consciousness, and the early universe can all be seen to come into actuality in a similar way, from an initially near uniform and undifferentiated background processuality. That is, the prebiotic soup gives rise to early life, early consciousness gets to be sculpted from a great blooming buzzing confusion as an organism goes through its perception action cycles, and the early universe comes into actuality from what may be called a primordial vacuum. Accordingly, process physics clarifies how on every scale of natural organization all kinds of activity patterns and process structures can emerge from an initially formless and indistinct background of dispositional processuality. Like so, it explains the constant cell-similar recurrence of cellular structures, feedback cycles, neural circuitry-like branching structures and networks, as well as all kinds of non-equilibrium mixed forms of all this. This occurs on all scales of organization from, from an initially undifferentiated near equilibrium background. All such structures can be found everywhere in the biosphere. In neural networks, tree root networks, river deltas, organ formation, foraging patterns of ant colonies, and so on. Moreover, 
the unified presentation of nature's object and subject-like aspects, as two integrated features of its modeling, gives process physics an edge over mainstream physics, which is ultimately incompatible with life and consciousness. And therefore, because process physics can give rise to all this, it can rightfully be considered a biocentric and utterly ecological physics. Above all, however, whereas mainstream physics is especially tuned to deal with locally singled out aspects of nature, process physics offers us a method to deal with nature as a whole. From this we can conclude that the best way to proceed for science is to try and exploit the best of both worlds, to get a binocular physics with the mainstream tradition being geared mostly towards practical applications and local modeling, whereas process physics is best equipped to deal with the modeling of nature as a whole. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know via the below included email address. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.